It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker to today's Medical Grand Rounds, which is hosted by the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. So our speaker today is Dr. Sharita Hill-Golden from Johns Hopkins University. As you see from her title slide, she's the Hugh McCormick Family Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism. She also holds an appointment as Professor of Epidemiology in the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And as of 2019, she was appointed the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer of Johns Hopkins Medicine. So just as a brief introduction, Dr. Golden received her undergraduate degree at University of Maryland, her MD at University of Virginia, uh, and then traveled to Johns Hopkins for her residency uh, and never left. Uh, she's been uh, a medical resident, uh, endocrinology fellow, uh, and then a faculty member since uh, 2000. Uh, she really has had a very distinguished career in endocrinology. Her CV, which is very thick, reads uh, um, uh, lists more than 300 publications, reviews, editorials, uh, and uh, a similar number of presentations. She's been very well funded in her research in, in diabetes and particularly uh, cardiovascular complications with diabetes um, uh, ever since she started as a, as a faculty member continuing up to the present time. So um, I first heard Dr. Golden um, earlier this year when she gave the, the very distinguished Clark Swain Memorial History of Endocrinology Lecture at the uh, 2021 virtual uh, Endocrine Society meetings. And I was so impressed with that presentation and what I learned from it that um, I decided uh, as I wrote to uh, Dr. Golden that uh, this really deserved a wider audience than endocrinologists because even though we take care of diabetics, everyone takes care of diabetics. Uh, they're, they're present in every practice. It doesn't matter what your subspecialty is. Um, and the other reason I wanted to uh, have her speak today is uh, everyone who knows me knows that I have a very uh, strong belief that if you don't know the history of where you've been, you can't understand where you are. Uh, and we in medicine and science believe that we are without bias and, and that, that uh, we don't uh, function on, on any biases. Uh, but that certainly has not been true historically. Uh, and that's what you will appreciate from Dr. Golden's talk. And uh, at the end of the talk, I, I think you'll see that many of our present health disparities in the area of diabetes and, and diabetic care uh, are rooted in the scientific and medical misconceptions uh, that have taken place uh, over really the last uh, century and, and maybe before that as well. So with that introduction uh, of our very distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Golden, welcome uh, to Georgetown and your virtual one hour trip down I-95 to visit us. Uh, hopefully, and, and, you know, we'll have you back to our endocrine division once we can uh, do things uh, in person and, and uh, uh, that that's a guarantee. But for the moment, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Verbalis, for your very generous introduction. And uh, I would love to make the trip down 95. I remember as a fellow reading about Dr. Verbalis's wonderful work on water balance. And um, and I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, so I'm very familiar with where you are. But um, due to the pandemic, we will uh, will function virtually for now. So thank you for um, inviting me and, and to speak about this um, topic. And, you know, I, I do agree with something that Dr. Verbalis said in order for us to really know where we're going and what our solutions to current day health crises are, it's really important to understand where we've been and what things are at the root because they really inform our intervention. So I'm going to talk about historical contributors to diabetes, disparities in diabetes care and outcomes. Is it biology, race, or racism? And so um, just... Um, I want to start out that I don't have any relevant um, financial disclosures and the objectives um, this afternoon are to articulate two medical and scientific contributors to um, diabetes disparities, to articulate two social conditions contributing to diabetes disparities, and to articulate interventions to reduce race and ethnic um, health and healthcare disparities and diabetes with an aim to achieve health equity. So that's our our ultimate goal. And so I start out showing this picture um, and realizing that I'm being very transparent 
ignorant about age for those of you who are really quick with math, but when I think about the evolution of you know diabetes disparities and many of the things that that have happened, many of them have happened um, um, have been revealed and come to fruition in my own lifetime. And so um, I was born two weeks about two weeks before um, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Um, he was assassinated on April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. As mentioned, I. Um, was born in the Washington DC area, in fact, at Providence Hospital, which is no longer um, open. And so you can see how H Street in Washington DC, you know, my grandmother's home looked before the unrest following Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and then how it looked after. And it took many years for that area um, of Washington to recover. And then in 1972, so when I was just four years old, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment became public, um, which revealed that, um, you know, men um, at Tuskegee University had basically been followed to evaluate the natural history of syphilis, but they were denied treatment of syphilis, even though at the time we knew penicillin was an effective treatment um, for the disease. So that not only resulted in long-term health consequences for them, but also um, for their families as well. And, um, and this was a, a study that was actually funded and run by our US Public Health Service. And obviously that stopped after this, but you know that really um, left a, um, a really lasting impact um, in, um, in many of our Black communities across the U.S. So in the early 80s, there was the establishment of a task force on Black and minority health. And um, the foundation for the establishment of that task force under U.S. Secretary of um, Health and Human Services, um, Margaret Heckler, was um, the Association of Minority Health Professional School study called Black and the Health Professions in the 1980s, a National Crisis and a Time for Action. And there were some very prominent um, physicians who were a part of that. So Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who was then the Dean and President of Morehouse School of Medicine, he'd go on to become a US, um, attorney, um, a US Surgeon General. Um, Dr. David Satcher, then the President of Meharry Medical College, again, a future su Surgeon General. Dr. Walter Bowie, the Dean of the Tuskegee University. And then Dr. M. Alfred Haynes, the Dean of the Charles Drew University of Medicine and Sciences. And what they articulated was a shortage of minorities in the health professions and health disparities among Blacks. And so they were um, engaged um, with um, Margaret Heckler when she launched a task force on minority health that resulted in the Heckler Report that was published in 1985. And in that report, um, they um, summarized that health disparities accounted for 60,000 excess deaths each year, um, that there were six causes of death that accounted for more than 80% of the mortality among Blacks and other minority populations. Um, and you can see that diabetes, which is the disease I spent my whole career studying, um, about 33% higher in Blacks compared to the white population at the time. And then they outlined recommendations to reduce disparities and the need to improve data collection, not only among Black Americans, but among Hispanics, um, Asian Americans, and American Indian and Alaska Natives. And so what happened after the Heckler Report was the establishment in 1986 of the um, Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, which was first led by Dr. Herbert Nickens. And then there were other outcomes. So there were pivotal legislation, funding, policies, research, and initiatives focused on minority health and health equity. The NIH Office of Minority Health was established, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There was also the establishment of the Health Resource and Services Administration, known as HRSA. And then there was more inclusive data collection um, techniques, as well as the establishment of institutions, centers, commissions, as well as state and local minority health offices. So, you know, if I reflect on a lot of this work, this was going on when I was in, um, in college and in medical school. And so with all of that focus, you would think that, um, you know, we would have made significant progress. But then the Institute of Medicine published this very famous report in 2003 called Unequal Treatment. And what that report did was instead of just describing disparities, it examined what are the health system provider and patient factors that contribute to those disparities. And their findings showed that ethnic minorities um, had less access to preventive care, treatment, and surgery, which resulted in delayed diagnoses and more advanced disease at the time of diagnosis. And there was a persistence of race and ethnic disparities disparities in health and healthcare, despite the um, things that I just mentioned. 
And so my favorite quote of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And if we think about that, when people come to us and they are sick, they are really at their most vulnerable. So to really um, not engage in equitable treatment as someone's most vulnerable point is, is inhumane. So one of the questions is how did we get here? What, what's the historical medical and scientific context of health disparities? And what's the role of the medical and scientific scientific community and defining differences in levels of humanity. And so even um, in the, back during the time of slavery, a lot of our current day medical advances were, um, were practiced on um, slaves without their consent um, and often without general anesthesia. So this is a very famous painting that shows Dr. J. Marion Sims, who's considered the father of modern day gynecologic surgery. He invented the speculum and all of those, those things, but he repeatedly experimented on and performed those procedures on slave women, not only without their consent, but without anesthesia. And this was at a time where ether was available. And he was rewarded with international acclaim as president of the American Medical Association. And, you know, how this has resulted in residual bias today is there is a, um, a sense in the medical community that African Americans have a higher pain threshold. And so therefore, if they're having a sickle cell crisis or recovering from surgery, that they're somehow drug seeking. And this is likely perpetuated from this lie that the physicians back then had to tell themselves for really engaging in what we considered to be barbaric behavior. Then there was also eugenics theory. So Dr. William Welch, who was the first dean of our Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the founding dean of our School of Hygiene and Public Health, really was an international and national expert in the scholarship of eugenics. And so eugenics was a, a quote unquote science of improving the human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable heritable characteristics. So basically that there were certain um, groups that were genetically superior to others. So it favored a Protestant Anglo-Saxon and, and Northern European um, origin. Um, it was the foundation for forced birth control, castrations, sterilizations and euthanasias from the early 1890s all the way up to the mid 70s. So not that long ago that this kind of practice ended. And then there were certain groups that were considered, you know, unfit, and there were even laws to prevent intermarrying. So, for example, those considered unfit were Blacks, Jews, and immigrants, particularly from Eastern Europe, um, the Balkans, and Southern Italy. And then in 1910, there was the um, publication of the Flexner Report that eliminated um, medical school as proprietary school and supported establishment of the biomedical model as a gold standard for medical training. This is the model that all of us um, have trained under, but it had racial implications. So it closed um, many medical schools around the US that could not um, live up to those standards. But what that meant for medical schools that were training black physicians is that the only ones that remained open after these forced closings were Howard Medical School and Meharry Medical College. And this was at a time where those who wanted to become black physicians couldn't gain access to predominantly white medical schools. So this means that African Americans were excluded from medical institutions, which left um, black patients and other populations vulnerable to medical abuses, um, and they faced ongoing barriers to medical education. And so if we think about that um, background in the context of the evolution of health disparities, there's a really outstanding book called um, Diabetes and a History of Race and Disease by um, Dr. Arlene Tuckman, um, who's a professor of history at Vanderbilt University. And she really um, takes the information I just shared with you and really sort of puts that in a context of how has that shaped the way that we think about and manage um, diabetes. And it is, it is really a fascinating read. So initially in the US, diabetes was seen to be highly prevalent in the Jewish community. It was called Judenkrankenheit, which was the Jewish malady in German. Um, and so in 1893, it was noted that there was a high prevalence of diabetes um, in certain patient populations. Physicians noticed this. And um, William Osler um, from Hopkins and um, Dr. Um, Elliot Joslin, um, who's sort of foundational for the very famous Joslin Diabetes Centers across the US, recognized what seemed to be a diabetes predisposition in Hebrews is how they, they they termed it, um, but this was thought to be due to nutritional access as well as longstanding oppression stress. So what their theory was, was that 
There were many um, Jewish individuals who were fleeing um, Eastern European poverty and hunger. When they were here in the U.S., they um, were exposed to more plentiful food and had better eating so that um, they were more likely to become obese and develop diabetes. So perhaps maybe it was really the obesity and not so much that it was genetic per se. And then I'm very interested in this part as an endocrinologist that um, they believe that some of the um, predisposition of diabetes may have been stressors related to adaptation. So they were considered the most nervous of the civilized people. So because they had a highly activated nervous system, um, as well as a high release of adrenaline, that that could lead to insulin resistance and to diabetes. So those were the theories for this. But then this began to be challenged in the 1930s as really related to weight gain and not related to, to, to race and really became refuted after World War II. So then um, as there was the evolution of the social um, order, there were anthropologists who were really insisting that races were products of culture and not biology. But um, again, because there was a movement to maintain the purity of the American race, which really translated into the white race, there were restrictive immigration and anti-miscegenation laws. So this would have been um, you know, sort of the time where, for example, restriction of um, Asians into the US was put into place. And then there were laws that people in different races shouldn't intermarry. Um, in the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924, that act defined what populations were considered Caucasian. So then as people immigrated to the U.S., they um, tried to really blend in as Caucasian. How can I be defined as white? So individuals who were considered to be able to assimilate um, could then be considered white. So those were um, Jews, um, Italians, Tetons from the um, sort of Greek Mediterranean area and French Canadians. So again, um, groups that could assimilate. So then as that began to happen, then diabetes was seen to perhaps be more prevalent in the white population, and it became a disease of the civilized middle and upper class. And so this is a very fascinating quote from a journalist in 1936 um, that wrote, um, that basically people with diabetes make a good deal better citizen than the average. They are never wasters or drunkards because they have to learn early in their disease to be controlled and self-reliant. They have greater intelligence than the average and they develop it by constant use. Of course, there undoubtedly have been diabetics with weak characters, but they don't live very long to tell the tale. I mean, just a fascinating perspective there. And so this then began to be seen as a disease of overindulgence because again, you know, in the 1920s, insulin was discovered. So now people could eat what they want because they could treat it with insulin. And the eugenicists became very concerned that people with diabetes, if they reproduce too much, they might be contributing to a defective gene pool, you know, related to diabetes. But because diabetes was seen to be a disease of the white middle to upper class and those of higher intelligence, um, diabetes got a pass at that time. And so um, really in the interwar years between World Wars I and II, this became a clean disease of whites. And, you know, Joslyn, um, you know, sort of said there were even good versus bad patients with diabetes. So those who had poor glycemic control and complications, it was really due to a personal failure and a lack of moral character. And that will sort of play into how diabetes sort of gets thought about subsequently in our history and later on and even into the current day. So despite the fact that this was seen as a disease of sort of middle to upper class white individuals, there were those in the US Public Health Service um, in the mid 1930s that released the National Health Survey on Chronic Disease and Disability. And they were recognizing, no, this is a disease, a chronic disease that is burdening the poor more than the well off. And that rates of diabetes seem to rise as poverty rose regardless of race. Um, and so those earlier reports did not address poor whites or people of color. So, you know, that's why that was really like not even highlighted in some of the early work I just shared. But this is really when the link between diabetes and wealth began to be questioned. And so, um, again, as the social order was changing, you know, if you think back to the early 1900s, not too long after the Civil War ended in Reconstruction, diabetes in the Black population was very rare. And in 1897, um, you know, diabetes in the Negro was considered to be rare. And in fact, there was a medical grand rounds at Johns Hopkins and it's in our archives. And it was called a case of diabetes in the Negro. Like it was so rare that it was a medical grand rounds delivered at Johns Hopkins. And today that seems so absurd as we think about who's impacted, but those were the times. So many were um, malnourished. Um, they were coming out of slavery. 
Um, there was a high death rate from infectious diseases, so TB, syphilis, cholera, yellow fever, smallpox. So many people just weren't living that long. There were very high infant and maternal mortality rates among African Americans, and they were engaged in high physical demand jobs, so sharecropping and a lot of heavy work. So there was an underestimation of the burden of disease in African Americans because they had infrequent interaction with the medical system. There was inaccurate death rate reporting. And then again, it was unclear like who was black. So while white had been defined defined by that previous act, it was unclear, you know, who was Black. And then there was pretty much an, an ignoring of the rising rates of diabetes through the early 20th century. So the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company noticed rising rates of diabetes among Blacks in this country um, in cities like New Orleans, Baltimore, and Atlanta. But because this was still considered a disease of civilization and Blacks were not believed to have these highly sensitive nervous systems that would put them at risk, this information was ignored. Um, because they were considered to be dull and uncivilized. And so it was believed then that they had racial immunity because of they, they were more primitive. And again, this is because the whole growing class of middle class Blacks that, you know, were in the urban areas were being completely ignored. And so there were physicians at Emory and Johns Hopkins that began to notice that the diabetes incidence rates are actually similar in Blacks and whites, and that they experience similar complications, but in fact, Blacks had a higher death rate, especially Black women. And Dr. Joslyn corroborated that in the sixth edition of his book, The Treatment of Diabetes Mellitus. And then subsequently, Dr. Benjamin De, um, Jablons, who was the head of the Physicians Division of the American Jewish Congress, said diabetes is not a racial disease. That really what we, are, we were seeing was due to improvements in economic conditions and food excess. And so there were several, there were um, four uh, African-American physicians who really worked to define what is, um, does diabetes actually look like in the Black community. And what they summarized is that diabetes was no respecter of persons, that the hustle and bustle um, proved that Blacks could be as nervous as any others in society, um, particularly that, that growing Black middle class. But post-World War II, diabetes was still seen as a white disease. And so unfortunately, diabetes and the resulting disabilities that were occurring in the Black community would remain um, largely invisible until that Heckler report in 1985, which is just shocking to think about. So what about diabetes in the Native American community? So similar to the Black community, there were very low rates of diabetes in the early 1900s. Again, diabetes was rare because it was considered a disease of the civilized. Um, and um, Native Americans were still dying of infectious diseases that were brought by colonial settlers. So they had a short life expectancy. Um, and then there were centuries of federal policies that had destroyed their land as well as their lifestyle and livelihood. Um, so again, short life expectancy and see high burden of infectious diseases, and they either avoided hospitals or lived in very dispersed conditions where they didn't have access to health care. But in the 1950s and 60s, the rising rate of diabetes in Native Americans began to become clear. And one of the things that happened, there were two acts, um, the Desert Land Act was one, where there was a drying up of the Gila River, and that had been the source of, um, of sort of the hydration that allowed the farming of the healthy food that the Native Americans ate and trading goods so that they could maintain an economy. But when the river was diverted to support the white settlers that were coming west, the river dried up. So that prevented the trading of farm goods with white settlers and travelers and now shifting to a reliance on government subsidies and reservations with poor conditions. So really with a lot of poverty and what we would consider today social determinants of health. So they were considered primitive people who were unequipped to adapt to the challenges of civilization, and that's why they were getting diabetes. Um, the US Public Health Service began to study them as a focus on you know, the genetics of remaining primitive because they were considered a less evolved population. And um, so in 1954, the Indian Health Service was transferred from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to the US Public Health Service, which was better resourced. And so there was the study of the, um, um, the Athmiel Odom and Pima uh, Indians in Arizona. And then there was debate about the high rates of diabetes prevalence and incidence being due to environment and not race. So Dr. Joslin thought this is really more environment, like sort of thinking about how the environment of the Native American community had been changed, wherein Dr. Bertram Krauss argued, no, it's race and genetics. And so really the importance of 
lifestyle and diabetes prevalence and incidence, though, despite this debate, really became to be recognized that that was an important contributor. And so there were two um, particular Indian um, Native American tribes that lived in completely different areas of the United States, and they both had low, air, low rates of diabetes. So the Athabascan Indians in Southwest Arizona and the Alaska Eskimos were noted to have very low rates of diabetes. And when they looked at what was common between these two, it was that they had active lifestyles and that diets that were heavy in protein with very moderate fat and low carbohydrates. So it was really their environment and not their genetics because genetically they were different groups. Um, that should have led to the conclusion that race was not a factor, but all Native Americans continued to be lumped together. So this distinction was not appreciated. So then to summarize, if we look at the evolution of the face of diabetes and its disparities over say a hundred year period, it started out as a Jewish malady due to nutritional excess, oppression, stress, and being a very nervous and civilized um, group. Then it subsequently became a disease of white America due to nutritional excess and overindulgence, a disease of the highly intelligent middle and upper class, and a disease of the civilized. Um, but then again, um, with the change in the social order and more um, you know, awareness of the health in, in the African American community, um, with Blacks it began to be seen as a disease of poor and minoritized communities in urban settings who had less intelligence and were less civilized. And then in the Native Americans, it was the disease of the primitive with a failure to adapt to uh, the Western civilization and the evolution of the whole thrifty gene hypothesis. And so that is really sort of how the medical and scientific establishment has contributed to how we view diabetes and how we view disparities. It explains how our medical system has violated the trust of certain communities, so they don't trust the medical establishment even today. Um, there are language and communication barriers and residual healthcare provider bias toward minoritized patients that impact a poor quality of care in our health system. So if we think about this bias as it relates to diabetes, um, diabetes, uh, because it became seen as a disease of the poor and the less intelligent, these patients were also seen to be less likely to cooperate. So once it was no longer a white middle class disease, then these patients were given over to medical students who performed exams and understaffed clinics. So this perpetuated the experimentation mindset. Um, there were very negative attitudes toward recipients of Medicaid, many of whom had diabetes. And then there were, the professionals were felt well, they needed to guide diabetes management because individuals just lacked the intelligence, despite maybe those who had high education being perfectly capable of engaging. And that bias persists in our medical system today. We have a very paternalistic way that we often think about patients with diabetes. So that's the medical and scientific context. What about the historical social context of, of health disparities? And I've alluded to a little bit of that um, with some of our communities. So as the narrative around diabetes changed, the face of diabetes evolved even further. And so um, there were Native American activists who really began to refute the fact that Native Americans were primitive and their lack of adaptation caused their high prevalence of diabetes, they tied it to colonialism and, um, and rejected this notion and really began to publish literature showing how the damming of the Gila River had actually contributed to um, the environmental changes that led them to rely on government subsidies. So Peter McDonald, who was the chair of the Navajo tribe in the 1970s, was a strong activist who cited water shortage, substandard housing, lack of refrigeration and unhealthy food as contributors to diabetes. And then Dr. Taylor, Mc Taylor McKenzie, who was the first Native, um, Native American medical school graduate pushed for the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act of 1976. There was also activation in the African American community. Um, so Dr. Richard Allen Williams, who became the assistant uh, medical director of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, General Hospital in Watts, published a textbook on diet um, black related diseases. And Dr. M. Alfred Haynes, um, who I mentioned earlier was an epidemiologist who wrote the gaps in health status between black and white Americans and began to document the difference in epi epidemiology and the death rates that, um, that we were seeing for chronic diseases. The other thing that happened in 1965 as a part of um, the second civil rights bill was the Immigration and Nationality Act. So there had been very, um, there was a 19, um, 1885 um, 
Chinese Immigration Exclusion Act that had really prevented um, Asians from immigrating to the United States. And then in the 1930s, um, there was another um, immigration ban on individuals coming from certain countries, even in Europe, but that was lifted in 1965. So at that time, there were Mexican Americans that began to immigrate to the United States. They were noted to have higher rates of obesity and diabetes than whites in the same neighborhood, but it was attributed to their Native American ancestry. So the thrifty gene concept was applied to that population as well, um, and which, which created a challenge in them being fully accepted as fully American and sort of being the perpetual foreigner, if you will. And so that same rationale was applied to Cuban and Puerto Rican immigrants to the U.S. as well. So again, you see this lumping that doesn't allow differentiation. But again, that, that became an activated community that became concerned with greater access to health services, as well as bilingual healthcare materials and providers. So with the lifting of that act, there was also an immigration of Japanese Americans to the US, and there was increased diabetes following their uh, migration here due to changes in diet and physical activity. 1950 was felt to be an inflection point um, where there was pro progression from sort of migrant labor um, roles um, to and poor economic conditions to improve standards of living. So for those who were um, Asian American who developed diabetes, this was thought to be a sign of successful assimilation. But what that failed to acknowledge was the inadequate nutrition and discrimination in housing and job advancement and medical attention, as well as the stress and strain of the internment years during World War II, where our own citizens um, you know, were, were um, put in the equivalent of concentration camps. So if we sort of put together all of our social conditions and policies, then, you know, there was, um, there was re racial residential segregation. So this was accomplished in the Black community through redlining and predatory lending practices, where as neighborhoods converted from um, white to Black neighborhoods, um, there would be predatory lending practices with subprime mortgages, which meant that those loans would have a high likelihood of default. So once that happened, there would literally be a red line drawn around that neighborhood to discourage not only future lending in that neighborhood, but um, a lack of future investment in the school systems, economic development, businesses, and public works. And so that led to racial residential segregation. And then similarly in the Native American community, the um, Homestead Act of 1862 and the Desert Land Act of 1877, again, that led to the drying up of the Gila River, led to a reliance of indigenous communities on reservations and government subsidies. So again, a different kind of racial residential segregation, but with similar results. Um, and then these populations had discrimination and access to high quality jobs with adequate health insurance. And many of these communities were engaged in farm and domestic labor, and they were excluded from the social security benefits of the New Deal legislation. So you can see again how um, that feeds into socioeconomic inequality. In addition, federal housing loans were refused to millions of not only black Americans, but Asian, Hispanic, Jewish, and immigrant families to the United States. And so this, again, has resulted in structural and institutional racism um, that um, even though those bans on federal housing loans were lifted with the 1968 um, Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, we now have neighborhoods that have decreased stability and cleanliness. There's a lack of sidewalks and parks and open green spaces for physical activity. People are living in environments where they don't have access to healthy food or affordable housing. And so, um, what that then means is that if you've got individuals who are already experienced on bias in the healthcare system, and then they're living and working in an environment where they can't exercise, gain access to healthy food and the like, then they're going to be more prone to develop obesity, have blood pressure, hyperglycemia, and ultimately develop diabetes, obesity, as well as other chronic health conditions. So if we think about the postmortem of the Heckler report, the recommendations on that report really focused on lifestyle choices and behavior. So people need to do better, but it did not focus on the need to further desegregate medical institutions. It didn't focus on improving access to quality health care, and it did not focus on increasing investments in preventive medicine. So again, it was focused on changing behavior and not conditions in which people live. And it also failed completely to discuss the plight of poor whites and those uh, and the role of socioeconomic disadvantage and diabetes risk. So there's a very large 
um, a poor white population in Appalachia that has very high rates of diabetes and its complications. So with all of that history, we want to like end on a high note. What can you do? Like, what is it that we can do understanding all of this history? So I think like individually, like we can all work on breaking our bias habit and really becoming an ally um, with, um, with marginalized communities. And so one of the approaches that we've been using um, at Hopkins is one called Bias Reduction in Internal Medicine. It was developed by Dr. Molly Carnes at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it's a three hour workshop. And what it does is um, when she studied this intervention, there were faculty in 46 intervention departments that were randomized to this intervention. And then there were faculty in 46 control departments. And after three months after the intervention, um, those in the intervention departments had increased awareness, motivation, self-efficacy, and action for engaging in gender equity promoting activities. Their specific focus was gender, but we've adapted this to all of the isms, if you will. And then um, they reported a more positive department climate. But I think importantly, the intervention departments had greater diversity and new hires two to three years later. And so again, this was a sustained effect. So more women hired on faculty and more of those underrepresented in medicine. And so the strategies that she shares in, um, in BREM is to recognize, label, and challenge stereotypes, um, to consider the opposite when there's data to support that, to identify counter stereotypical exemplars. So who is a group that you know you have a bias toward, but then there are people that you admire in that particular socio-demographic group who you, whose characteristics you really admire, that will help you view that whole group differently. It's important to individuate and perceive variability so everyone doesn't have the same experiences. To practice common identity formation, even though we may have a different racial, ethnic, background or sexual orientation or gender identity background, what do we have in common um, that unites us? And then practice perspective taking. What is it like to have people question your competence, assume you're poor because you are in a, a certain group? What is that like to really understand that? And then that allows you to recite a growth mindset and internal motivational messages. So some people say, well, we all have bias and we're biased and that's just the way it is and there's nothing I can do about it. That is not a growth mindset. You know, a growth mindset is I intentionally want to push myself to learn, to understand, to get to know and other, understand other people so that I can be um, a better citizen of society and for us, um, more powerful agents in healthcare. The other um, component of allyship that we have felt is really important in our health system is that we noticed around 2017, again, when we had sort of an immigration ban from certain countries, that um, some of our patients were saying some very nasty things to our providers. I don't want a Muslim taking care of me. You have an accent, where are you from? I would like another healthcare provider. And you know, we um, feel that it is really important not to violate the civil rights of our employees and our trainees by switching providers because we know that all of our providers are competent. Um, and, um, and, and that shows an important, important form of allyship because those individuals become second victims when no one steps in to advocate for them. So we have a prohibiting discrimination um, by patients against employees policy. And this also um, covers our trainees um, in the School of Medicine. And so there are rare circumstances under which we will make a, a provider switch based on a protected class. So um, if um, there is a gender specific physical exam or someone has been um, exposed to either an opposite sex or same sex sexual assault that's been traumatic, we would honor a request in that setting because we don't want to re-traumatize an individual. Um, or if there is an emergency where someone's requesting a specific provider and we need to quickly do that to stabilize the patient, once the patient is stable, then we won't honor those kinds of requests moving forward. So that's sort of the way that we've um, approached this across our institution. And then we've also been collaborating with the University of Virginia, um, my medical school alma mater, um, with Dr. Um, Drs. Townsend and Plews Ogan on um, a, a, their stepping in collaboration, which teaches this allyship um, in a workshop format with case examples. And we will be doing this for all of our incoming interns. And we'll also be doing it for our um, UME and GME leaders, because again, our trainees experience this quite often. So another important solution, that's what you can do individually. 
in terms of bias and allyship. Another solution is to infuse health equity principles into our cl clinical workflows. So we should be thinking about health equity in all of our clinical operations. So ensuring the implementation of what's called the national class standards. So these are culturally and linguistically appropriate standards. Um, there are 15 of them, but the principal standard is to provide um, effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality of care and services that are responsive to the diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. So this is making sure even among your own employees, can everybody understand everything that's been sent out? And what is the reading level? And what languages do we need to translate it into? Then it's also important for us to sort of systemically address the social determinants of health. And we know that there are interventions in diabetes that have been shown to be effective. And I just wanna share those with you. Um, and these were summarized in an excellent review written by Dr. Felicia Hill Briggs, who is um, past president of, the, um, of healthcare and education for the American Diabetes Association. So these are the five domains of the social determinants of health. So what about interventions to address um, health and healthcare? So access, affordability, and quality. So in terms of access, when the Affordable um, Care Act was signed into law, um, there was an increase in insurance coverage for adults with diabetes, um, particularly um, um, populations that were most at risk in 2016. There was also an increase in access to care and diabetes detection and a decrease in costs related to non-adherence, particularly in states that underwent the Medicaid expansion. Another um, access intervention that's been shown to be effective are community health workers. They have been shown to um, help improve diabetes knowledge and self-care behaviors, as well as glycemic control in underserved African-American and Hispanic communities. What about um, interventions to increase the affordability of healthcare? So self-management interventions that are delivered directly to the underserved, perhaps even sometimes outside of our healthcare system, help to lower hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure. And then we can do interventions with health IT to help promote improve quality of diabetes care among clinicians, and that's improve the quality of diabetes care among um, racial and ethnic minority populations. And so we know that those successful interventions in the healthcare system target several levels in patients with diabetes. So there are patient level interventions. So we know that interpersonal connections rather than computer-based connections um, with patients that are culturally tailored, again, using community health workers, improve glycemic control and diabetes knowledge. Um, interventions targeted at the providers, providers like us, um, that provide in-person feedback rather than just computerized decision support are more likely to change provider behavior and improve diabetes outcomes. If we look at the microsystem or the sort of healthcare organizational um, framework, disease management programs that identify diabetes populations through registries, um, incorporate practice guidelines into our health IT systems, use health IT to track and monitor patients and incorporate care management to address barriers, improve um, diabetes outcomes. And then community and health system interventions that are culturally tailored to empower patients and build community coalition and advocacy. Again, you see the community health workers incorporated into that and the case management, all of those improve minority health care and reduce racial and ethnic disparities in um, diabetes care as well as other chronic diseases. So that's sort of health care and health interventions. What about interventions aimed at the neighborhood and the built environment? And so um, there are um, three areas where interventions have been shown to be effective in diabetes. Um, in housing, um, there was a famous study called Moving to Opportunity, published in the New England Journal in 2011, where close to 4,500 families were randomized into three groups. So they either received a low poverty voucher, which required them to move from a high poverty census tract to a low poverty census tract. They got a traditional voucher where they weren't given any location restrictions. And then there was a control group that got no new assistance. And and what they found is that those that move from high poverty to low poverty neighborhoods were um, had a lower um, prevalence of extreme obesity and diabetes when compared to control. And it probably was not just the housing by itself, but the fact that they also may have lived in neighborhoods with more walkability, more job access, more access to healthy food. So this was a very powerful um, intervention. There was another housing intervention called the Initiative to End Chronic Homelessness, that in addition to placing homeless individuals in permanent housing, they also gave them primary care and mental health care access as well, and that resulted in a decreased risk of new onset diabetes. <laughs> 
Um, what about the built environment? We know that policies to improve the walkability and green space infrastructure improve obesity, which is a, a main risk factor for developing um, type two diabetes. And then the food environment. So increasing grocery store presence in low income neighborhoods has resulted in a decrease in rising diabetes prevalence and that diabetes targeted food and self-management um, care at food banks and pantries have improved blood sugar control, nutritional consumption and food insecurity. So this is actually giving people access to um, a healthy food and then, and then teaching them about that as well. So this is really, um, really important interventions. And then um, another solution I think is very important is advocacy and policy. And one thing I've learned is that we as healthcare providers, our voice really does matter in what happens. And so these are like all of the different movements that I have um, seen in my lifetime um, and have watched things change and evolve to um, a more inclusive environment. And it's been because of the voices of, um, of generations and people and impacted groups who wanted to advocate for the changes they needed for, for equity. And so in 2010, the Affordable Care Act um, increased insurance coverage um, to um, by expanding access to primary health care. It prohibited discrimination in health care. Um, it aimed to address diversity and cultural competency of the healthcare workforce. It enhanced data collection and research um, into health disparities. There was a strengthening of federal minority health infrastructure by augmenting the Office of Minority Health. And then there was the establishment of offices of minority health within each of the six health, health and human services agencies. And then there was a redesignation of the National Center on Minority Health to the National Institute of Minority Health Disparities at the NIH Institute, and they now have their own funding mechanisms and um, budget. The other place where advocacy is important is, um, is with with your government and community affairs team um, at MedStar, I would encourage you to connect with them. So at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, I connected with um, Elizabeth Hafey, who's our assistant director um, for state affairs for Johns Hopkins University in Medicine. And when I was seeing this, the awful disparities among um, Black and Latinx communities in Baltimore in particular, um, and across the state of Maryland, and, the, and, and particularly the fact that having diabetes, which these populations already had a high burden of, worsened their outcomes. Um, you know, she helped me to talk to our um, Black, Latino, and Asian and Pacific Islander caucuses and the state, state house, the COVID response joint legislative group. Like I joked, I would talk to anyone who would listen about this. And I think it became really important because that enabled us to partner with a lot of our legislators in the Maryland um, House and Senate to get, um, you know, health disparities focused legislation um, um, approved, um, and it will soon be um, signed um, into law. The session just ended in Maryland about three weeks ago. So we're really excited about the initiatives that we were able to have a voice in and to help shape and to help testify for. And so I just point this out because a lot of these structural inequities really need to be undone with um, legislation and policy. And that requires those of us, I'm an endocrinologist, I've spent most of my career talking about molecules, but, but now I think about these kind of issues as a way to bring about meaningful change. And then finally, in closing, I just want to mention an important solution is biomedical workforce diversity. So, you know, I share with you the impact of the um, Flexner report. We're still feeling that impact today. Um, so these are double AMC data of all active positions in the United States by race and ethnicity. And you can see that, um, you know, we have 17% um, that are Asian, 5.8% Hispanic, 5% are Black or African American, less than 1% each Native American or um, Pacific Islander. And, um, and that, that's compared to the distribution of those populations um, in the US. And what the implications are of the Flexner report were summarized in this study last summer. What this report tried to do was estimate the consequences of closing those medical schools and had they been remained open or had they been adequately resourced to remain open to live up to the biomedical standard, then how many more black physicians might we have trained in the US? And so they estimated that if those five medical schools that were closed had remained open, that they would have collectively trained an additional 35,315 graduates by 2019, which would have meant about 29% increase in the number of black physicians in 2019 alone. And I argue they would not have contributed to graduating more black physicians, but other underrepresented groups, because there are many other underrepresented groups that attend historically black medical schools across the US.
And so we know that diversity leads to greater scientific impact. And um, this paper showed that ethnicity was strongly correlated with this, the um, scientific impact of papers, um, independent of other aspects. And in this study, ethnic diversity of the authors resulted in a 10% impact gain for the papers and a 47% impact gain for the scientists involved. And so that's what really motivated me to um, sort of change my career focus about two years ago from um, focusing uh, mostly on my you know, sort of scientific and research career and clinical program building to think more specifically about how can I take those skills and apply it to diversity, inclusion, and health equity on a system level. So this is the terrific team that I have the pleasure to work with every day across the School of Medicine um, and in our health system. And we just um, launched in the fall our Roadmap 2023 plan. This is our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic um, plan for the next three years. And you'll see that it is linked to our overall Johns Hopkins Medicine strategic plan and goals because um, we believe that these initiatives should be interwoven into all aspects of our organization and not just done on the side so we can have a full equity lens. So, um, and closing, I'd just like to thank you again for the invitation. I would just like to always thank and acknowledge um, my family. Um, my um, son, Andrew Golden, will graduate from Northwestern next month with a dual major in um, journalism and African-American studies. And so it's very interesting having a 21-year-old um, you know, and, and talk about the historical context and everything and everything that's happened over the last year. We have had some fascinating family conversations, as you can imagine, but I feel like and he's taught me um, a lot, and it's fun to share books with your children too. So, um, so grateful for for him always being an inspiration to my husband, um, Christopher Golden, who's a neonatologist on faculty at Hopkins and is the pediatric um, clerkship director there. And of course, to my my parents, to my mother and father, um, who were blessed to turn 85 years old last year. Um, I'm very grateful they are now vaccinated. I feel like I spent a year um, making sure that they um, stayed alive through the pandemic. But I feel like the the passion I have around really uplifting the voices of those who um, can't be heard really um, stems from what they taught me growing up. And then this last slide is um, our House Staff Diversity Council. The young people, um, the physicians in training, our next generation have really been very inspirational. I've always been one to protest intellectually, but um, you know, last summer, you know, with the White Coast for Black Lives rally, um, you know, they really inspired me to, um, to raise my voice more. So I always like to acknowledge them.